Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. This episode of the Loki podcast was recorded on April 15th, 2020. My very special guest in this episode is voice artist and actress Karen Anglin. Karen comes to us fresh from recent success with the hit comedy TV show Work in Progress. Karen is going to share with us some of her insights into the voiceover industry as well as the acting world, sharing with us things like how to add more emotion into your voice or work with different emotions, how to put yourself into a more conversational style so you don't sound like you're presenting at or talking at people. Also, Karen tells us some of her secrets for taking care of your voice, where especially when your voice is your instrument for your work, whether you're a singer, actor, or presenter, or coach, if your voice is your moneymaker, you won't want to miss this episode of the Loki Podcast. Welcome to the Loki Podcast with John Ball from Present Influence. Welcome back to the Loki podcast. I'm very excited this week to have a very special guest, my biggest celebrity guest so far, my first (laughs) celebrity guest, I'd have to say. Uh, uh, Let's welcome to the show, first of all, Karen Anglin. Hi, Karen. Hi, how are you? It's so great to be here. I am fantastic. I'm super glad to have you here as well. So I'm very much looking forward to speaking with you. And uh, we've known each other for a while. And so it's going to be great to get to share some of the things that uh, that we have planned for this podcast. Yeah. And it's going to be very much focused on voice. So uh, anyone who's doing any kind of presentation or performance work, this should be relevant to to anybody and very interesting as well. So to introduce those of you who haven't come across Karen Anglin before, Karen is an actress and a voice actress and you're very likely to have heard her voice before and not even realized it. And also you may well find that you get to see Karen in some of her TV shows that she's been in, currently starring in the hit Showtime comedy called Work in Progress. Now, if you're in the UK and you want to see that, it's on Sky Comedy. If you're in the US, you can watch it on Showtime. If you have access to Showtime, you can get a free month right now to start watching watching Karen. (laughs) And you've been renewed for a second season as well, right? Yes, very exciting. Yeah, that is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Wonderful. So we're going to do something that we don't normally do now that we've introduced you. We're going to go to a commercial break. In the solitude of the night, your life plays like a newsreel in your mind. Then comes the new day. For more than 100 years, that has been the SunTrust way. Fashion is what you love, so switch to GEICO, because you could save 15% or more on car insurance, and that would help make the things you love that much easier to get. These are the qualities of a visionary. The extraordinary Lexus LS. Vision in motion. Because for the first time ever, you can brew McCafe coffee at home. It's comfort food, but I'm not getting too comfortable with my meatloaf recipe. Tonight, I'm adding a packet of Hidden Valley Original Ranch with whole grain oats, real fruit, and a sweet kiss of honey. It's only natural they've got the right kind of energy. Classically beautiful, breathable, super comfy, and practically seamless. Skechers. Footwear done right. Simbacord. Breathe better starting within five minutes. Do you believe in love at first sight? At Riverside Medical Center, we do. We see it every day. Organic green tea with out-of-the-world flavor. Where all-inclusive is all-exclusive. Find your keepsake ornament at Hallmark Gold Crown Stores. 25% less sugar. You're welcome. 
Fantastic. Now, <laughs> Commercial what, break. You're welcome. <laughs> what, what our listeners may not realize is that you were the voice of every single one of those commercials. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yet, it just listening to them back to back. Now, you sent me a selection, and, and that was the one that um, I think I chose that because each one sounds like a different person. Yeah. I mean, that the idea, so the idea when you put together a voice, like that's my voice reel um, or demo, is that you you get the idea of what that person's voice sounds like. You know, you get what her, um, or in this case me, what my wheelhouse is, but you also want to give the different colors, the different nuances of it. Because, you know, especially when I listen to that, one of the ones that's the most off track for me and has actually been the longest playing commercial for me is Simba Court. And they wanted this very upbeat and it was actually a cartoon character. So it's a wolf. (laughs) It's a cartoon wolf doctor. And they wanted her voice very warm and very high. So for me, when I'm relaxed, you know, I kind of resonate more in my chest voice. But for that, I had to get up more like this because I want to make sure you feel safe. So you kind of just do these um, different registers according to the direction you get and according to the intention of the commercial. So it's right. good. It's a, it's a compliment that you notice that there's different nuances because that's, you know, in one short minute or minute in 20, you're, you're trying to show all that you can do. There, there were a lot of things, a lot of things I noticed in there. And I, and I do want to come back to some of that. But, but before we do, is it OK to ask how long you've been in the industry? Yes, let's age me right away. <laughs> yeah, it's been I've been in the industry for 28 years. Great. So you are very experienced and also you have a level of success in the industry and nobility that many people would be very very envious of, right? Uh I feel very very grateful. I mean, 28 years there there's been so many changes as I mentioned to you before when we were talking one time about my biz. Um, the, the, the vibe, you know, the voice, the kind of it voice has changed and evolved over 28 years, depending on the political climate, depending on the social climate, you know, it's really like, as our country changes, um, so do the needs of advertising and commercials and what you want to get across. So I do feel proud that, um, you know, that I, that I've lasted as long as I have and made the pivots that I've needed to vocally as well as, Uh, As you know, you know, when I first started in the business, we never did anything out of our home. We always went down to an agency and you actually auditioned with live people. And now it's um, the team of me, myself and I, (laughs) most of the time in a home studio. Yeah. Well, I remember you telling me a little while back that um, there's some level of luck or synchronicity if you like or getting into the industry at a time when your kind of voice is popular which maybe leads on from what you're saying and yeah you happen to get in at a time when your voice was yeah I mean it's a funny story um because I so I moved it was I was only 23 when I get it so I moved when I was 22 to the midwest to Chicago and I was working at a restaurant um, and uh, I decided to leave. A friend was like, hey, we need help at our music house, which basically did the music. It was called Steve Ford Music, music for commercials. So I was like, anything to get out of the restaurant is my side hustle. So I went there and there I learned so much about just all the components that go into commercials just by simply like helping serve bagels and entertaining clients. But the, the irony is that Every time a client came in from an advertising firm, they're like, wow, I really love your voice. Could you just lay this down for me? Would you lay this down for me? So my boss was like, that's it. We need to make you a demo because like you shouldn't be doing this for free. So at the time, that was when there's always like a celebrity voice that is kind of um, iconic during that time. And at that time, it was Demi Moore. So it kind of went away from the the higher pitched voice. Um, there were now women that were coming on, even the Bonnie Hunts that had a little bit more gravel, could still show empathy, compassion, um, storytelling, but had a voice that wasn't necessarily like perfect and um, smooth, I guess. You know, it has a little, like for me, when I got into it, it was like, you have texture, you have two, you have gravel <clears throat> as I cough up a lung. <laughs> um, that's what, what people wanted was kind of vocal texture. Yeah. 
So I can I can understand that. And let, let me ask you this though: I, I've done some voice coaching workshops in the past, not not as a, a leader on this. It's not my area of, of expertise, although it's one I'm very interested in. One of the things that was suggested to me by a voice coach was to find a model for your voice, someone who you'd like to aim for sounding like. Is that something you ever did, or how, how did you initially work on your voice? No, that's so interesting. I've never heard that before. Um, because I guess the idea is, um, from a competitive standpoint, is for you to bring your own voice, like your own experience um, to the mic and to cut through. So I don't, we definitely get in, in auditions, you know, you'll get direction on scripts and it will say, um, a Tina Fey, Rashida Jones, you know, so that's more like a throwaway. They'll give celebrity references as a tone. I get like, um, Scarlett Johansson a lot. So I know that's going to be a more intimate, sexier, um, grittier read. So we get them as a um, form of direction, but in general, um, unless you're doing another sector of voiceover, which is called ADR, which is like when a celebrity does a film and they can't do the, um, the post-production, the audio post-production, you may mirror a celebrity's voice. So they'll go, oh, okay, you sound like I was doing Julianne Moore for a while. Um, you somehow can have the tonality in the ear for like sounding like a celebrity and they may put your voice in for a celeb in a movie that's ADR, but for commercial, for promo, all that other stuff, it's really about um, bringing your presence, your voice um, to the game. That's fascinating. Yeah. If you did have to choose a voice model, well, I'll share with you mine. <laughs> I'll share with you it. mine first of all. Okay. <laughs> and okay. we'll see if it makes sense. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, so I think it's something maybe I have in common with Seth MacFarlane that I, I selected my voice model as being um, Sir Patrick Stewart. Oh, yes. I just think he has the most amazing, resonant, yes. commanding voice. I'm like, yeah, I want to sound more like him. I don't yes. think I do, I may be, but yes. maybe a bit more than I used to. <laughs> Yeah, so if I had a celeb voice, gosh, let me think about that. Um, so now you've got me on the English train. For some reason, um, the first one that came was, uh, um, oh my gosh, I love her so much. And now her, her name just left me. Um, Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren, that's a good choice. I adore her. She's yeah, yeah, like an too. idol of mine. She's just, because when I think about um, my industry, whether it's for on camera or voice, there's an element, the celebrities I guess that I admire are those who really own who they are, own their um, vocal quality, own their strength um, in storytelling. And so um, I really love her. I do get a lot of stuff, um, Sigourney Weaver, um, direction. So I do um, have a similar tonality and, and also love her voice, like in terms of the yeah. way she narrates and so many of the documentaries and things like that. So she's another um, one that I adore vocally. Amazing choices. I love both of them. Fantastic. Yeah. I can see that. Maybe, maybe some people might select you as their vocal model <laughs> without after listening to this. That would be awesome. Your next podcast. That would, that would be that. fantastic. Anyone who selects Karen as their voice model, please let us know. And Karen <laughs> would, would certainly would like to hear from you. What, was it your intention when you, when you got into working in the industry that, that it was going to be voice work that you did or, or did you start off with? No, um, honestly, yeah, that was the, that was the big surprise. Um, I, I, I moved here because of the theater at the time. Um, Steppenwolf was really big and there was a lot of uh, storefront theater. So my background um, was really theater. And then I also did um, some limited on camera stuff at the time, some small TV roles when I was a 20 something, how I fell into it really was working at that music house. I had always been told um, that I had a great voice. And then I did do at that same time that my boss was like, hey, let's put something together. I was doing a show and I had to play eight different characters um, yeah. in this theater production. And um, at any given time, you know, you don't know who's in the audience. And a lot of times industry people will be in the audience. So for me, in order to give them <clears throat> each character a, a definite um, personality and a, a difference, the nuances to be different, I, I just approached it from a, a vocal standpoint. To me, that made sense. Um, so I really did... Um, a lot of work on just distinguishing the characters vocally. After that show, there was a couple of performances where, where 
theater agents were there, there, and then their staff was there. And then there was a voiceover agent that said, hey, you know, have you ever, ever thought about voiceover? At the time, the school that I went to, I went to Boston College. And while it was a great theater program, it wasn't the programs like uh, we have at um, in Chicago where there's like the Columbia's or the DePaul's where they give you every um, aspect of the industry. So I didn't know anything at that time way back when about something that was a sector called voiceover. Um, so, you know, you to, for me, when I, um, I try to listen to the universe when it's giving me signals um, and a lot of people were like, duh, you should be doing this. So um, I just pursued it. I listened and I put together um, my demo. And then the minute I put together that demo, um, I had actually done a couple of auditions through agencies that were saying, okay, we'll look at some new talent. And then I um, actually right away, right out of the gate, booked this huge Bud Light campaign. There was like 23 yeah. different commercials. Um, so that was kind of a, a huge pat on the back, like you're in the right track. <laughs> I think you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then my agent insisted that I quit my day job and the rest is history. So yeah. Fantastic. So, so that was your start. And from, from the voice reading, and this is just my idle curiosity, but what has been the most fun voice work that you've done or an example of the most fun? Um, gosh, the most fun. I mean, it's always fun. I haven't actually, I've auditioned for animation. So I always think it's fun. Um, and that's still a dream of mine to do um, animation at some point. I think it's really fun. I always seem to play like the evil queen because of my vocal range being really deep you know yeah. um I Disney Pixar we're talking to you yes. <laughs> <Get on it. laughs> you know some really juicy evil queen laugh <laughs> um but I love um I, I don't know there's so many aspects that I love about different campaigns to me um I love doing commercials that really um make a difference, you know, reach an audience. I think, you know, right now you see the power of voiceover. There's so many commercials during this COVID-19 crisis that we're all going through. Um, the importance of, you know, commercials and advertising to just allay fears, to um, elicit compassion, um, to comfort, you know, to me, I think that always makes me feel like I'm being of service when I use my voice. Um, and it's really fun, I guess, probably way back when I used to do uh, promo voiceovers for sci-fi network. So it's, it's pretty fun to hear your voice introduce a new show to, you know, like coming up next, Johnny ball is you know, <laughs> an evil King. So um, I loved the promo stuff. That was um, really fun to do as well. Excellent. Yes. I was listening to some of your other voice reels with the sci-fi show introduction. Yeah. yeah they were a lot fun. of fun as well. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, great. And I, I, I love all of this. The, uh, one thing that I that I do want to get into with you about, we talked when we were planning this episode about emotion and the voice. And it's something that as a public speaker, as someone who, uh, who regularly does Toastmasters events and public speaking, that I'm very big on people putting more emotion into what they're saying because mm -hmm. really uh, part of it is what you say, but the bigger part of it so much is how you say it and, mm -hmm. and the emotion and energy mm -hmm. you put into it. I think listening just, just to the small examples we had from your voice reel and the differences in energy from each bit to bit, there was a different emotion to each of them, yes. which is very much what I want to come back to. And I think you were already uh, leading into that. So I want to get from you a bit more of an idea about how you go about that and what, the, what importance that has to, to you and your work, putting emotion into that. Yeah, it's funny. The minute you say emotion, um, I immediately think about intention. And um, I think the emotion comes when you're really decisive about your intention. So, you know, especially in, in your industry, for example, you may have um, a speech that you have to give that um, you need to convince someone of something, or you might want to simply just inform, or maybe you're brought in to um, bring comfort to a company and tell them it's going to be okay. We've got this. We're, we're in this together. You know, I think it's really about, um, I think speaking, especially in front of people um, can be a very nerve wracking experience for many. And I think that nerve wrack, um, even when you're auditioning, for me, the big switch in my career when I really felt like I started to sing in auditions is when I took 
the pressure off myself, not about what I have to prove or how I have to deliver, but um, what's my intention? You know, in this scene, what's my intention? In this speech I'm giving you those people, what is my intention or my action that I want to um, accomplish? You know, like I said, is it to excite and um, encourage? Is it to uh, comfort and bring compassion to the crowd or the other character? So I think when you start to think about what's your intention to, to move the audience, it takes a little of the nerves off yourself and then you're connecting because that's really what voiceover is. I think the people that do it really well and have lasted in the industry don't just have a good voice because there's a lot of people that have wonderful speaking voices, but it has to be, you have to take this medium, whether it's you, one person talking in front of 900 people, or even you talking through the mic, trying to reach 900 people is somehow make it like it's an intimate connection between just two people. To me, that's the most authentic um, use of your voice. I, I love that. And uh, it, it um, reminds me of being taught or even teaching sometimes about overcoming stage fright and, and mm -hmm. fear by actually focusing on that you're doing it for them. And so I like yes. the idea yes. of having that intention for for how you're going to deliver it and, and, for, and for the people who are going to be listening to it as well. I really love that. Yeah. I do think it's, um, I do find personally it makes a difference when, when I create an intention for how I want to come across. Absolutely. I absolutely. Think, I think I've only ever really applied that when I've, when I've been singing and I don't sing professionally. Oh, I was going to say, gonna, I didn't know you had a little secret. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Karaoke King here, but not honestly, not. Uh, roll the tape, not, uh, roll the tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately there is video evidence, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not putting it up here. But, um, but yeah, it's, so that's maybe one of the only times where, because I, I like to sing for myself and we probably all yeah. like to sing in the shower and stuff like that. And, uh, right. and, and I sometimes find, that and I have done this maybe with audio recordings as well that I've done by myself, especially ones that have been more along the hypnotic or visualization side. Yeah, that I do create that intention for yes. how I want my voice to sound, and I do find that consciously and unconsciously it goes more in that direction. Yeah, and you're you're less um, conscious of it. It's like it's taking that to me, if this makes sense taking that proving energy right out of your voice that I think that people can sense as inauthenticity. So when you're speaking, like we're speaking, we don't think when we're ourselves, when we're Karen Anglin, as opposed to a character, um, we don't think like, am I hitting the mark? Am I convincing them? It's like, we're so already naturally in the intention of, I wanna make my daughter feel better and feel calm. I wanna make my husband feel understood we know it just comes automatically. And so I think that's what's really successful in communication in the arts, whether it's voiceover or an actor. It's like when you see an actor that does at least the ones that I admire that do amazing work or the compliments I get when they say, God, it doesn't even feel like you're acting. It's like, yay, that's the point is that you want to be almost a fly in the wall listening or watching this person being just an authentic um, person with intention, you know? not trying to, uh, I don't know, pose. Yeah, I get you. You know? And uh, yeah, not, so it doesn't look like acting. It right, like a performance. right. And I think people, like I said, I think people can, um, can sniff inauthenticity pretty easily, um, whether it's, like I said, you just listening or, or watching. So for me, the key is really about grounding yourself, you know, in intention. I mean, I do a, a practice every morning, even just for my day. It's like, you know, how do I want to feel? Who do I want to be? What do I want to receive? What do I want to give? And just even kind of getting your mind in that um, space, it it sets your day up to be intentional. You know, it's it it gives a little magic to the day because you're you're saying this is what I'd like to create. You know, this or something better. So bring it. Yeah, I think I think we've uh, I've touched on these things a bit in some of my previous podcasts. I've just recently with a lady called Cindy Ashton, which was mm -hmm. a great, a short, power-packed uh, little podcast. And and previously with with one of her friends, interesting uh, Stephanie Scheller, where we touched on voice and stuff as well and the authenticity yeah. behind that. One of the things that I will always teach and aim to pass on to presenters or anyone who works with their voice. I mean, I don't just do presentations and public speaking. I do uh, coaching, online training, uh, webinars, all sorts of things. 
all of them are using my voice. So as much mm -hmm. as a, a singer or a voice artist like yourself, uh, my voice is my is my money maker, if you like. Yes, right, um, right. And so it's it's super important. And I'll always teach other people to, um, if they because I'm trying to put this the right way. People will ask me. In fact, just last night I got an email from a, one of my uh, Toastmasters buddies, and saying, "How do I? How do I get more engage, emotional engagement from the audience?" And I say, oh, "You have yeah. to put yourself into the emotional <clears throat> state that you want to get them to, yes. so that you can lead them there right. rather than just tell them to go there. <laughs> so you're not right. you're not showing them. You're you're right. leading them. You're pulling them towards that by being there yourself." Does that make sense to you? It does. And you know what? It, it brings me to my next point I was going to say. Now, while I don't do a lot of um, public speaking per se, you know, I've done interviews, et cetera, and it, it's still nerve wracking because you want to be natural and be on and, you know, be affable. But I think it's really important um, to check in with your audience. Now, it's a little harder, you know, since we've all been sheltering in place, I've been, you know, trying to keep my knowledge up and do different webinars and you can definitely tell the successful webinars versus the not successful um, for me, just because it's my biz vocally, you know, someone's just talking like this the whole time. And now you're this and na, 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 yeah. na, 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 and you're like, I'm out, I'm checked out. There's got to be a way where you engage by, um, you know, just checking in, whether it's changing the, the pacing of your voice, you know? Um, and, and when you're live, I think, you can get a read on your audience's body language, you know, if they're getting antsy, if they're, it's, I think it's really important to just kind of get the feel of what the audience needs. If they see antsy, seem antsy and, you know, are yawning, then yeah, you might have to give more vocal energy. You might yeah. have to move in a different way. And I think also the important thing, I'm thinking about it right now as I'm watching my hands move. Um, to me, I could never do voiceover if I wasn't moving my hands, like you would think I'm fully Irish, but you would think I was Italian um, because I'm constantly moving my hands to get a certain emotion. So I think engaging your body too um, is really important to, for the instrument as well. I like that. It's interesting because that might sort of go in contradiction to what a lot of public speaking coaches would teach, where you need to be very controlled of your movement so that it doesn't become a distraction. Uh, but, yeah. but when you're but when you're talking about performing, like in natural conversation, like we're having right now, um, my hands are moving. Now you can't see them off the screen, but you can see right, my shoulders. Right. Going. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of so my, Yeah, we we talk with our hands as well. Yes, many, yes. many of us do. Not not everybody, but many of us do. It, and it is an additional level of expression. And I get you. If I was doing, uh, if I was recording an audio book uh, or a story or anything sort of uh, fictional. I would be wanting to be fully embodying that as well yeah. as just being in, in the state of it as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. to me, you know, animation, anime, it's, it's motion, you know, it's moving. And so I think naturally um, when you speak, when you want to um, punctuate points, you know, we use, we use our bodies. When, when it comes to different, different styles, one of the, hardest ones uh, and any public speaker will relate to this i'm sure mm -hmm. is comedy mm -hmm. and you have to have a, a certain delivery mm -hmm. and you have a, a a wonderful delivery in the comedy voiceover that i've seen from you and, <laughs> and i want to i want to share that with people first and then we're going to come okay, back yeah. and, come back and, and talk about it a bit. I hope you're having fun. I know it sucks Brad's out of town. Yeah, you know, but it's still nice to have some me time, right? There she is. <laughs> Babe, stop. What? I can't help it. I love you so much. <laughs> oh, watch it, guy. Oh, you want to fight me? Let's get it, bro. Okay, that's my cue. I got to get him out of here. Okay, I'll see you guys later. Bye. You'll never find love like this. Okay, that's me. Wishing your man was here, he would be a handful. But wow, do you miss him. Now, you don't have to. Introducing My Drunk Boyfriend, the only life-size doll guaranteed to make you feel like your man is right there with you. And he's hammered. 150 pounds of dead weight, and you get to be his babysitter. Designed to mimic the behavior of the sloppy grown man that you can't get enough of. Programmed to say over 200 unique phrases. I think I'm going to take piano lessons. 
It's always a fun night with my drunk boyfriend. Cops. Who wants cops? You'll love hearing about his big plans. I'm going to do it. I'm going to call my boss and quit. Or when he cries over a dead relative he's never mentioned before. <laughs> my uncle. <laughs> My uncle! With my drunk boyfriend beside you, you'll never miss out on a night of rolling him over when he snores. And oh no, watch out. My drunk boyfriend has a timer set to get up in the middle of the night and pee into your hamper. No, no, that's the laundry. Good, good, right? Plus, with the new My Drunk Boyfriend expansion pack, you'll get all sorts of accessories, like pants that don't come all the way off, a charred frozen pizza that he brought into bed, a glass of water he will ignore. And That's hilarious. I absolutely love that sketch. I love that one. You actually, playing that reminded me that by far was the most fun I've had. Doing yeah. Voiceover. And I've done a couple for, um, for SNL and audition for them. And it's, it's always a blast to do um, those kind of things because most of their stuff when they needed voiceovers for their skits, they're ironic, you know? So it, for that one, the direction that I came in when they were giving me direction, I said, oh, it's kind of like you want me to be an authentic home shopping network voice. Do you know what I mean? Like when you do those kind of infomercial home shopping network, that's to me where the humor comes from because it's such an absurd thing like this blow up doll you know this blow up boyfriend is coming to your door so you have to make it like you're selling it hard just like you would be you know buying something off of a off of a tv ad for a home shopping network i, I think it, really it, fun. It, but if that were me it would take a, at least several takes to stop myself laughing trying to read <laughs> stuff out <laughs> well what was so fun too for me is um, on those things, it's a reveal. Like I never saw the video. So I thought the script was hysterical and I was like, this is going to be great. But then, so for SNL, what you do is it's like just an hour before the show and then you you record it and then you're kind of uh, waiting to make sure they don't need any changes or they have an, uh, need to drop in a different uh, line. So you do, you do it that night and then that evening, if you don't hear back, they say, okay, no, we're great. We don't need you. Then you get to see it on screen. So, you know, combining the visual of those talents and then my voice, it just, it really all came together. It was really um, very well received, which was nice. It was hilarious. Uh, and when you sent me the link to that, I, I absolutely loved it right away. It was, uh, it was <laughs> so, so funny. To I'm going to put a link to that, to that video <laughs> in the description box. Anyone who wants to go and watch the whole uh, oh, parody yeah. commercial, I, I highly recommend it's it. It's great. Very, very funny. Good. So, so <laughs> I wanted to come back then to the, uh, to the different styles of, of voice as well and, and how you go about approaching that kind of delivery and maybe even insights that you have into... Um, how to get better at that from your own journey? Um, I think, you know, I think knowing the styles of, um, for me, like even the styles of shows, the styles of reads that are out there. So, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I learned when I was first getting into the business is I, I was a newbie, so I didn't have access to all the scripts, although the music house that I worked at, I had friends that were in advertising, so they supplied some. But someone said, you know, just listen, like tape TV, you know, DVR. Uh, in those days, it was um, taping it on your VCR, I think. But um, DVR commercials, and you kind of listen to like, what's the sound out there? What is the sound of like a home shopping network voice? What is the sound of like someone that would sell orange juice versus... Um, feminine products versus uh, beer, you know, um, listening to those different sounds, listening to different um, networks, even what's the vibe on a comedy central. Like I've done some voiceovers for comedy central also that I love um, because I, in general, don't do comedic voices, you know, um, but I've done the ironic voices for comedy. So yeah. those ones to me are always the most fun, but there's a definite vibe or sound to each um, network, each type of commercial. So I guess for me, I just try to stay educated on on what those sounds are so that if someone says, you know, I need to do it like this or like that show or like this person, that I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's interesting. Yes, yesterday I was uh, redesigning the logo for the podcast to make it a bit more, something that pops a bit more and uh, doesn't look quite so, uh, it doesn't, didn't look very friendly and inviting. It was like, I'm happy with the logo, but I wanted something that looked a bit, I don't know, a bit more active. And, yeah. um, and while I was doing that, some of the fonts that I was working through is like, 
you start to realize when you look through all these different writing fonts what you associate different writing styles yeah. to and and that there are different things like some of them relate specifically to markets and some of them relate specifically to to kids and school and yeah uh, and even even comic um for I know everyone's familiar with comic sans and things and and it really got me got me thinking along a similar lines of you you don't generally pay too much attention to that there are all these different styles out there but many of them relate very specifically to specific styles as well so it's fascinating to hear that in a vocal context as mm-hmm. well that, that yeah that i mean i think i was just saying this to to my son because he's making his own music these days and i said you know it it's okay to listen to or in my case like watch um you know the greats or the people you admire a, a really prolific voiceover when i was first getting into the business um it was a man voiceover, but he said, yeah, you know what? You listen to what sounds good to you or who's successful out there, <clears throat> cop it and make it your own. And so the idea is like, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for for people who are speaking, I mean, to me, one of the best mediums to uh, watch for good speakers is any TED or TEDx talk. Sure. And I think when you, you know, whatever industry you're in, it's like if you watch the greats, you go, what, you analyze what makes it successful? What makes it effective? Why is the audience so engaged? What about their voice makes me want to listen? What about how they hold themselves? You know, so for me, I'm very much, I guess, because it's my acting background, um, a studier of, of human nature. Um, and I'm also extremely competitive. So when I know there's someone that's great at what they do, I, I, I want to study them and go, what makes them effective? You know, and I think when you watch any of the TED Talks, especially, I think those are so effective because they're people who are passionate about um, what they're, the information they're giving, but they're just really authentic. They're really grounded. They really have the intention of wanting you to be like as lit up about what they're talking about um, as they are. So I think, you know, to me, advice for people wanting to, get better at speaking, whether it's behind the mic or, or in person is to start doing your research, you know, start seeing like what sounds good and why to you. So that whole phrase again, cop it and make it your own. Like what about, and what do you relate that you have like that person, you know? Oh, well I have a, you know, a vocal quality like that. It tends to be more calming. So I don't have to work on that part, but I need to work on the, um, maybe slowing down. Maybe I, I speak too fast. I think also, um, the pace, um, not just like the nuances of your voice, but like pacing is a great way also to engage or disengage an audience for yeah. sure. Absolutely. It, interestingly, um, one of the things, when I first started doing public speaking competitions, which isn't so long ago in my life, but when I first started doing that, one of the things that I did, because I'm, I'm big on the research and I, I do yeah. have uh, maybe some uh, obsessive compulsive tendencies, perhaps. But, uh, <laughs> it's the same, it's why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> but I spent a, a lot of time watching videos of um, Toastmasters uh, speeches. From, mm-hmm. from winners and people who'd been like fin- finalists and, and seeing what I could learn from them. What, what did I like or didn't like about right. their performances? How did they structure it? How did they sound? Absolutely. Um, noticing probably one of the most important things, which has been one of my biggest lessons over recent years, noticing to leave some gaps, to leave some pauses yes. for, for people to uh, just have a moment with a, with a thought mm-hmm. or to have mm-hmm. their internal response or, or a moment for a laugh to actually allow it and not stifle it, that those are some of the most important parts of, of speaking and, and presenting work. Absolutely, because what you brought up is that, you know, for you when you have a speech, I'm sure, um, rehearse it's like this art of you want it to be rehearsed and you want it to sound natural. (laughs) You know, it's like the direction for voiceover is always like, we want, you know, we want it to be natural off the cuff, real person, but they're hiring a voiceover. So you just have to mimic what do you do as a real person when you're speaking? You pause. Occasionally you don't want to say um all the time, but like a pause in some way, um, going to the next phrase and turning it with a different emotion. You know, like when I look at even copy or a speech, to me, it's really important to look at the beats 
So in the beginning, you may be introducing a, a problem. Um, and then where is that light where the solution comes? You know, whether it's like, oh, you're worried about um, your car being wrecked. State Farm has, you know, you do these switches where like, here's the solution. And similarly with speeches, I would think, you know, there's these subtle beats throughout. And I think it's really important to honor the beats and to, to almost broadcast those beats and switch for your audience so that they're on board. You tell a personal story. It's really heartbreaking, right? You got to give them some breathing room to just kind of let in what you said. And now you're going to tell them, but here's how I triumphed. So now there's a different energy. This was horrible, but, but what made me resilient is, and now you're, you know, you're bringing them on this journey. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, a great practice tool for presenters and public speakers, for sure, and maybe for, for actors as well, is mm-hmm. to get a hold of some, some great speeches and practice delivering them. May, if you want, practice them in the style of the person who delivered them uh, to give yourself more variety or work it in your style and, and look for things like picking up on those beats and those, uh, those transitions, if you like, the yeah, emotional absolutely. in there as well. That's fantastic. I, I just think that's the most important thing, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in order to engage an audience. I mean, it's even as simple as I coach, although I get eye rolls for my kids when they have to deliver speeches, but you know, in general, again, people are nervous having to speak in front of a lot of people. Yeah. And I think if you just steamroll through information or steamroll through your story or steamroll through your performance, you're not allowing it to breathe, right? You're not having this connection. I have to remind, you know, my kids or anyone that I coach is like, there has to be this give and take, right? Between audience and speaker. There has to be this breathing room. You have to check in, you know, if, if, you, if you and I were having a conversation and then you're looking away the whole time, I'm going to be like, hello, are you, you know, are you interested? Are you engaged? Uh, I've just finished my dance, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one, I mean, one thing that you can guarantee nearly uh, for every Toastmaster, anyone who's ever been to a Toastmasters meeting will have heard feedback being given about vocal variety. So this is mm. a super important area yeah. and one that many people do struggle with uh, and, and sometimes do find themselves often mainly with nerves because people don't generally naturally speak in a robotic style. But right. sometimes when they tense up, they, they start to do that or become monotone or you say that if they're not actually connecting with the audience and that is one of the big things as well that uh because you said earlier about people sort of picking up on cues from the from their audience for example yeah and i think you can only really do that when you are not in your head completely about it you totally. have to be you have to be able to to connect with them and one of the reasons why so many presenters and speakers don't do that is because they haven't practiced what they're doing enough to be able to get out of their head and actually uh, think, okay, I've practiced it enough that I don't really need to think about it. I can just get up and deliver it. Mm-hmm. And then you can work on all the sorts of more minute cues. Uh, and that is uh, when, when you have the chance to practice a presentation or a speech or a webinar or whatever it is you're going to do, that you, when you start moving out of being in your own head and trying to analyze yourself whilst you're doing yes. it, your connection level is going to rocket. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to me, I think part of the being in your head is, again, is, is putting, is having that um, usually disempowering um, inner monologue about what are they thinking? The fear around what what's being thought of you? Um, am I interesting enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I handsome enough? Am I engaging enough? I mean, to me, what immediately came to me for people, you know, that you coach in your speeches is, I think one of the um, really important things is to just be comfortable on stage in front of people yeah. saying nothing. You know what I mean? Because I think where the inner voice comes is, is, is really just the nerves of being in front of people and the worry about what's going through their minds, what's going through their minds. And then, and then you've got this own speech or delivery you have to give. So I think if you could dispel some of that like worry about what the audience in terms of what they're thinking, but really just take them in. You know, like just taking them in and remembering that these are all people just like you. How would you want to be reached? You know, how would you want to be connected with? I mean, 
that's the only way you can own your own individuality is say, what would be interesting for me? And it may hit, I'm sure you've learned, it may hit or it may not, but you know, you'll learn over the process, but I think it's really about authenticity and and connection. So it's like, what works for you? If that works for you, then you're going to authentically deliver to me a speech, a story that feels natural, that feels um, connected. But when you're saying, okay, here's my story, and then you just freeze and look at all those people and think, what are they going to think of it? Um, how is it going to come off? Then you're, you're, you know, you're, you're putting your power, you're giving your power away. And that's really, to me, in any performance uh, level, it's like, how do I regain my power? I love that. Thank you. I'd be remiss as a podcast host if I didn't ask you, um, as a vocal professional, how you take care of your voice, because I know I can be guilty of this, and certainly mm-hmm. um, public speakers and presenters don't always think about actually looking after their instrument, their tool. Yeah. And I'm guessing you probably do. So tell us what you do to help yourself look after your voice. I mean, the biggest thing is hydration. Water is king. Um, if I know I have a, a lot of voiceovers that day, um, I just, and actually I've learned, this is a, over the years, cold, cold water can be um, constricting. Um, it, it can kind of put a little bit of a strain on my voice. So um, normally like room temp water is better. Um, hydration is key. I think, you know, every individual is different. I know I can't, even though I love me some coffee with a lot of cream. Um, I, in general, dairy is not my friend, um, especially vocally. So if I know that I'm going to be recording, then I I will not do um, anything with cream or dairy in it because it, it, you know, dairy in general, um, it, it works on the mucous membrane. So it can tend to make you more stuffed up. It can tend to make you have a lot of (coughs) clearing and cracking in your throat, um, especially during uh, the winter. I am probably a freak about, I'm always wearing scarves. You know where I live in Chicago, it's cold basically nine months out of the year. Um, I just like to keep my actual like throat um, warm all the time. So just kind of keeping that cold wind um, off my throat and chest. Um, and those are really the, the things that I do. I think like, you know, room temperature liquids tea is okay but room temperature is generally um no extremes you know no extreme hot no extreme cold if you know you're going to be speaking yeah yeah you you were just reminding me of uh of uh my first time visiting chicago in the winter (laughs) and i think i was saying this then at the westin i think it was and um i just walked out of the hotel and we were going for dinner only across the road and uh, someone said, oh, do you not have a hat or anything like that? I said, oh, no, I'll be yeah. all right. We're going to Yeah, I'm only going out. 10 blocks. <laughs> <laughs> I st- st- honestly stepped out the door. And I was like, oh, no, this is freezing. I had to go back in again and grab a, a hat. And yeah, said, oh, it's yeah. like the wind bitch slaps you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special kind of cold. And with the grid system and the wind blowing yes. in off, off the river. Well, and especially like, because of the, um, well, you've got the lake downtown. Mm-hmm. And then you've also got the river. So if you go over that bridge, it's just, it's a different kind of wind. It's literally my very first agency. I used to always say, you know, you cross the block and it was like a wind tunnel. I didn't even have to like walk. The wind would literally push me across the street. It was so bad. I can, I can well believe it. It's called the Windy City. Windy City yes, for a reason. For a reason. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with that, I mean, some, some, great, some great voice tips there. And if someone, if someone for example, is just thinking about uh, or think they've, thinks they've got a great voice or is looking to get into the industry, I know you've said before to me that there have been some big changes in the industry. What, what's the, what are things like? What's the general feeling there at the moment in the voice industry? Yeah, I think the biggest change, you know, in direction that we got hit over the head with probably, I mean, it may even be like 10 years now, but was... Um, this this idea of a real person, um, natural, conversational comes up a lot. Um, even sometimes, like, you know, I'll get the direction, throw it away. Um, which means in when I first got in the business, so in the 90s, <clears throat> it was very much looking for um, a spokesperson voice. Do you know what I mean? Like the voice of authority, the spokesperson. And I think there was a lot of people, um, too, 
that came from different backgrounds. So it's either actors that came into voiceover or there were radio people. And radio people were used to talking like this and they know how to do do a delivery. And it's, it's um, yes, they have a beautiful voice and they can deliver it, but there was a move away from that kind of being talked at to an intimacy um, of being talked to. Uh, that was the biggest, for me, the biggest switch. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think... I think for me, um, it was sometimes I do stuff at the beginning and it's funny, I, I, I'll do it at the beginning of a session and the, the people from the advertising company, whether it's a producer or a writer, will think that I'm actually talking. I'll go, um, I'll, 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 I'll lead into the copy with something like, you know what I really need? And then I'll go lean cuisine, da, 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 da. <laughs> so, and they'll go, what? And I was like, oh no, that's just my lead in you know, or you know what you really need? It's, it's a lead in to kind of make it conversational because sometimes you're given copy. I'm looking at my lean cuisine copy in front of me. That's trying to sell a product, but it's like, you don't want to sell it. You don't want to say lean cuisine to the TV dinners. You can and start talking at them. You want to say it like I'm recommending it to you. Like this, this is the bomb. You got to try these. These are amazing. So it's kind of this switch of, um, of being a little bit more relaxed, talking to a friend, intimacy. That's the real trend rather than the, you know, almighty knowing deliverer of uh, information. I like that. And does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and I, you've just given, uh, I think you just provided a very useful tool that some of us can, can use to perhaps work on sounding a bit more conversational. Yeah. But, uh, there's this thing that um, I, I've, commented on for a number of years now maybe just when I started having awareness of it really that uh, particularly in the UK and I don't know if you get to see that much UK TV in the US but I know yeah. some, some things maybe but particularly on documentaries there is this thing and, and even see it sometimes from quite well-known actors as well that they have this I'm presenting now voice Mm-hmm. And, and, it, yes. and it just doesn't sound very, very natural yeah, that, to me. That's exactly. So that's exactly it. It was there used to be a sound, a, pre, a presentational sound for sure. And the minute that switched, the minute that trend, I don't know who the first person was like, let's make it real people. Let's make it conversational. You not only saw these new, um, literally off the street voiceovers, people that were not a radio voice and not an actor getting into voiceover because they loved that real vibe, that real guy, that real gal. Um, The people that had been in the business had to almost retrain ourselves because when you're doing it, you know, for 20 years and then someone says, okay, now make it like, you know, you're just like guy off the street. You're so used to a certain sound or being this voice of authority. And then you're like, oh, how do I still be the voice of authority, but lay back a little on that. And it really, again, is just imagining, again, who am I saying this thing to? So even though it's State Farm and you're supposed to be the voice of of compassion and you're you're telling this audience, we're going to be here for you, you have to act as if I'm only telling you, John, you know, I'm only saying, hey, listen, I know these are really effed up times, but this is what you need, as opposed to at this time, now you need to go to State Farm to no one wants to be talked to or at, you know, they want to have a conversation with you. Yeah. No, I really like this idea. I mean, I, I've come across the concept before of, uh, and certainly use it of imagining who you want to deliver to and, mm-hmm. uh, and adre- uh, aiming to address somebody like you were addressing someone, you know, well in yes. a presentation or a speech. And I, and I really like that, but this is a, a marked addition to that, that you can actually add in kind of having that leading conversation in your head and then pick up from where it would yes. be more natural as yeah. a conversation. That, yeah. that's, a, that's a really a great tool. I'm sure a lot of people are going to appreciate that. I do. Yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a great one because it, it gets you kind of out of your head or it gets you in the intention. Similarly, you know, like I said, sometimes I'll go, if I'm delivering something, you know what you need? And then I'll go into the, I'm here, or I'll just simply say, I'm here for you. And then I'll go into this, you know, it's just getting you in kind of out of your head of the copy and, and, and being purposeful in your communication. I know. I'm going to use that a lot. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. The, the, the thing I wanted to to come back to there, if, if somebody is trying to break into the voiceover business right now, Mm -hmm. is there still much opportunity or is it really challenging right now? 
I mean, I, I always, you know, hate to be, I hope I'm a glass half full person. I think that it is definitely more saturated um, than when I started. Um, I mean, it, it's now especially because so many people work out of their home studios. You know, you're making submissions uh, all over the country. So there, there is definitely um, a lot of competition, but but again, you know, I, I came into it not really knowing anything necessarily about the biz, just coming from an acting background. I think I naturally had chops for for doing the voiceover stuff. But I think to me, I always say to people that want to get into it, it's like, listen again to what's out there. You know, if you want to, I hate to say to someone, go invest in a two to three thousand dollar demo reel before you ever know if you can be viable in, in the business. You know, you have to first do your research. Like you said, we're both research geeks. What are the kind of commercials that are out there? And and what are the kind of voices that are out there? Um, listen to them, tape, uh, you know, two hours, DVR two hours of television, and then scroll through the commercials and listen. Um, could I Could I be that kind of voice? Oh, I'm that kind of voice. I'm more of a comforting voice, or I'm more the beer guy voice. And then kind of find your wheelhouse because to me, everybody has a wheelhouse of like, I'm the go-to person for certain types of stuff. I can go outside of that range, but everybody is kind of a go-to for certain things. So find out what your wheelhouse is. And then I would throw together um, just, you know, you just, what you do is you just transcribe copy. If you see a commercial, transcribe it and then record it and put three spots together. And for the most part, I mean, now there's so many, again, it's saturated because there's so many voice casting um, agencies out there that are online. I personally don't know very much about them or the validity of them just because I've always had an agent. But, you know, there's also right now, everybody has so much time on their hands because they're working from home. Now might be a great time to put together some spots, put in a demo, MP3 it to uh, uh, someone you want to pitch an agent and say, hey, you know, I've, I've put together these spots. I'd love to have you listen to them and get some feedback. And then you're opening the door to an agency and then maybe they'll give you feedback like, oh, well, we've kind of got our, our company of voiceovers. We're not looking right now. That's never, to me, I, I never take no. That just means not, no, not now. You know, and then you follow up and say, hey, remember I sent you those? I put another new spot together. To me, that's the way to get your foot in the door is to is to do your research first, align with like what's authentic for you, what your sound would be, and then get feedback from people in the industry. You know, agents um, have been listening to hundreds and hundreds of um, voiceovers and auditions on a weekly basis. So they know what cuts through. They know what sounds natural. That to me is is the best way to kind of get an idea of could you get your foot in the door? Now, I can't help but notice that I think you are the uh, most vocally, what's the word I want to look for here? The most vocally rich guest I've had on my podcast so far. Oh, thank you. And not just for your talent. It's the, the quality of audio in, in your room as well is, is incredible. Thank you. Tell my agents. <laughs> <laughs> I was very lucky. It's funny. Now I'm getting a lot of people asking me advice for for home studios because people that didn't have them are obviously scrambling. Um, I was lucky. So when I used to live in LA and I came back to have my, um, my first child in the Midwest, I still kept my agents um, on the coasts. So it just behooved me to have a studio that I could work out of. And um, I got a lot of great advice uh, from engineers, sound engineer um, friend in the business. So it does help. And I think a good mic really helps as well. Sure. Um, different mics work on different people uh, better, but I, I um, have a love affair with this mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your, 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 your mic sounds great. My, mine is a bit more sort of budget podcasting kind of mic, but, you know, hopefully in the future, it yeah, will, it will, yeah. I'll step up. Uh, give me some tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. As nice as it is to you know, be here in the Loki coffee shop, uh, it certainly <laughs> doesn't have always necessarily the best acoustics either. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, looking at things like having your, your studio area that's... Uh, Got, I see the insulation foam up. You have a great yeah. microphone that's uh, that's uh, hooked up to a stand and uh, mm -hmm. uh, what the thing that what's the thing that stops it from uh, the popper? Yeah, yeah so the pea popper. I was yeah. a notorious pea popper, so you know, 
I, I learned about that fast. <laughs> those, those are all great, uh, great things to have. So I think you can, I mean, one thing is obviously if you're going to be a professional artist like yourself, yeah, having something like that is a great resource. But even if you don't have that, there's a lot you can do even budget level to get yourself started and still do some reasonable quality re- recording. For sure, although, for sure. I'm sure my voice doesn't sound nearly as uh, full of quality and rich as yours does right now. Uh, and that's for various reasons. But uh, but mainly, uh, it's, a lot of it is the audio equipment and, and the quality of that. However, it's enough to be able to do this kind of work. And it's enough for generally the, you know, the most of the work I do is audio and vocals, already, as we've already talked about. Yeah. So, I mean, it should, budget isn't really uh, something that should restrict you. So, even no. the more basic tools, you can get going with it. But obviously, Absolutely. as you progress, you're going to want more quality equipment. Sure. But I think that's the thing that stops you know, a lot of people from starting anything, right? You You look at the, and I'm as guilty as anyone of it. I'm not a big fan of being the apprentice. I love being the master. And I think giving yourself permission to be the apprentice and just to to own where you are, you know, knowing, okay, yes, I know there's so much more for me to learn, but I'm going to just, you know, honor where I am and do what I can now. And then trust that the knowledge that I need will come to me, the knowledge about the equipment that I'll have the resources I need, or I'll seek the resources I need. You know, nowadays everything is you can Google it or YouTube it, you know, um, there's so many more resources available to you at your fingertips than when I got in the biz for sure. Yeah. This this has been really, really fascinating stuff. I'm sure, um, I'm sure my audience will never forgive me if I don't ask you about your new show, Work in Progress. Yes. Can, can you tell us a bit about the premise of the show? Because I haven't got to see it yet, but I'm going to go and check out. As well, I- and it's so funny because I just, I said I was texting, texting my director friend um, that also besides being able to watch it in the UK on Sky Comedy, there's also Sky Canal. I'm not familiar with these. Sky Canal and Hulu are apparently the big um, venues okay. in Europe that yeah. you can uh, watch the show. I think you um, can get Hulu online. in. Europe okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so you'll be able to see it. Um, right. Yeah, this is just a, a gem that came to me. Um, I worked with this, actually, ironically, the director um, and I were husband and wife, vocal husband and wife for, for like three years on a, um, a big eagle commercial, giant eagle commercial. So I knew him in the industry as an actor and uh, voiceover and he and Abby, who is the lead, Abby McEnany, she is the lead in the show. They worked together on this. She had done a one-woman show. She's an improver, an incredible improver and comedian. And she had done this one-woman show called Work in Progress. And when Tim saw it, you know, he was like, I totally see developing this into a series, you know, about your life. And so they were going to just make it into um, basically self-produce it and make it into like little mini um, episodes and series. And um, then Lily Wachowski uh, came on board as a producer who is responsible for the Matrix um, Sense series. Eight, which I love. Yes, yeah, yeah. and Sense Eight, exactly. So um, she um, got on board and they submitted it to Sundance um, Film Festival, unbeknownst to me, which was always a dream. Um, to be able to go to. So I just thought we were making this indie TV um, episodic series uh, on our own. And I was pleased as punch to be a part of it. And then it got picked up at Sundance Film Festival, did really, really well. That's where Showtime uh, saw us and decided to pick us up and we went to series. So um, it's really, it's just a, a very authentic, you know, the work in progress is what you would think. It's this woman, she says she's a 45 year old self self proclaimed dyke that um it seems unfinished you know everybody else's life is launching and she's still a work in progress you know she doesn't have love in her life i play her sister allison um who has it all together the perfect hubby the kids you know i'm very type a on top of it the fixer the cleaner upper as a sis and um so it's really her just being authentic about her feeling less than and and trying to get her um her life in order and 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 reconnect again with um falling in love yeah. um the scripts are just so so funny and so um also like 
there's heartbreaking moments and because it's just, it's all Abby's story um, just there, you know, um, for everybody to see it's, it deals with um, her OCD. It deals with her um, depression, um, but all in tongue in cheek ways, you know, that um, makes people be able to see a little of themselves in it. So a little bit like the flea bag genre. Yeah. 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 What did someone said? It's, it's like, um, I think a long time ago, Tim said, it's like modern family meets transparent. Right. <laughs> okay. It's, it's probably a combo of that. Excellent. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. When, you, when do you start filming season two? So we were supposed to be starting in August. So um, I'm praying to, to, the, see <laughs> yeah, to the gods that we um, do it. So last year we premiered in December of 2019. So that, that will basically shooting August through November and will probably premiere similarly somewhere around December, January for Fantastic. season two. Well, I'm definitely going to be going and checking it out and uh, yeah, encourage yeah, the audience to are, as well. I'm really, I've really been looking forward to seeing it and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to see it become an even bigger hit. So, uh, certainly Yes, me well. too. Me too. I think, like I said, right now the audience response has just been so amazing and critically it's been really acclaimed. Um, I think yeah. that we've got good momentum. For I saw a really high score on Rotten Tomatoes. It's, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's very popular. Yeah, fantastic. I just oh. love the way you say tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Rotten <Right in> tomatoes. <laughs> I don't know. Potatoes, I sound like potatoes. a 19, 1930s uh, gangster in a film. I'm trying to do my <laughs> It's not good. Great. Well, that's, that's wonderful. It's, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you. And um, I did want to ask you, you so you mentioned that you'd love to be in an animation and the mm-hmm. sort of wicked queen or evil stepmother kind of yeah. thing which would be a lot of fun so much fun are there uh, any other sort of roles or styles or roles that you really would love to get your teeth into hmm vocally or uh, any any or, or, yeah um you know I mean, I think it's also really fun. And maybe that's why I went with the evil queen, because that's usually vocally what I play. But I think it would be really um, fun to play the bad guy. You know, like I tend to, um, although I'm usually like, you know, the characters that that I'm, my character descriptions are usually formidable um, and uh, uh, unwavering, you know. So that's usually a lawyer or a doctor or I'm a mom. But it'd be really fun to play some kind of um, villain. I also would love when I did theater I feel like I was um constantly in a period piece either Irish or English or Scottish um I was always in a period piece and I just watched Little Women with my daughter um and I'm also a huge Jane Austen geek because I was an English major in college so I would love to do a period piece get back to like my you know George Bernard Shaw days and <laughs> Oliver. You Down know, to the Abbey or something. Yes, like totally. I would love that. That to me, it's just fun. That's part of the like, you know, the 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 little girl inside of the adult that's a performer that would love to play dress up. <laughs> could, could, absolutely, do, could absolutely see you doing that. I hope that some casting agents are listening in and thinking, oh yeah, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I, would love, that I would love it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Is there a bit of wisdom or advice either related to the industry or just in general that you would like to leave everyone with? Wow. No pressure, just a um a no pressure. A, a taught Say wisdom bite. <laughs> you know, I think that the number one thing um as we're talking about everything from um voiceover to uh delivering speeches to the industry I think that to me, it's so important to um, to develop yourself, you know, behind the artist. I think that people can take a lot of classes in, in vocal delivery and take a lot of acting classes and and uh, Toastmaster classes. But I think if you don't really ground yourself, you know, really deal with like, what are your fears around this performing, um, this performance or this industry? Um, what are your strengths? You know, I think it's just really about being honest with yourself and, and putting your best foot forward is, is by 
feeding yourself, you know, like I don't think that I could perform or give or serve to anybody unless I filled my own cup up. And so I think it's really important to just fill your own cup up, um, tap into what makes you feel happy and grounded and content. And then you're not needing anything, right? You're already fulfilled. So someone said to me one time uh, to the effect of like walking into the room, whatever room that is, whether it's an audio booth or a stage, um, like, you know, you'd like, you were already invited, you know, like you're, you're already loved. You're already invited. You already belong. I think a lot of people, especially maybe in the arts industries are, are, are looking to prove something. But I think when you really just start to work on your own sense of worthiness, your own sense of belonging, your own sense of self-love, it just comes through. Then you're the light, you know, and people always hire the light. Yeah. I love that. And now, right now, at time of recording, that we're still in lockdown with uh, right. COVID nineteen and things like that. Yeah. And and this is an important time to to take care of yourself and to yes. show a bit of self love and kindness. So I love that. Absolutely. Can, Absolutely. Can I, can I share with the audience the the nickname I came up with for you? <laughs> yes. Is that allowed? <laughs> yes, that is allowed. That I, I still use now. <laughs> that I call Karen Special K. <laughs> <laughs> Because she's a super special lady, and and, uh, and also just ha- it was a bit of a a bit of a resource anchor as well for you, right? To have that sort of name that you could like. Yes, yes, it's like my alter ego. You know, it's like I don't have um, Sasha Fierce like Beyonce. <laughs> Special K. Special K. Well, and the irony is I used to be the voice of Special K. No, you never told me that. Yeah. For years and years and years, it was one of my best, most prolific gigs. How did um, you ever tell me? So. That? That when you said that, I just giggled so hard because honestly, I use it as like my alter ego. Like, okay, when I'm feeling down or not enough, or can I get this, you know, this uh, gig produced or this audition uh, pumped out? I'm always like, what would Special K do? She would kick some, you know what? (laughs) Thank you for that. I now have my stage name. (laughs) Some people are definitely going to want to find out more about you and maybe even check out some of your your showreel and some of your your yeah. Where can they go to do that? So my website, I just actually did a whole rehaul on it and everything is there, www.karen with an I. So it's K-A-R-I-N Anglin, A-N-G-L-I-N.com. Excellent. com. yeah. I'm going to put the link to that and the link to the... Uh, to the Saturday Night Live clip and Perfect. all the other stuff into the yeah, into and you'll get to see some work well. of progress reels. Uh, there's not only my real, uh, my professional reel, but work in progress um, reels under video. So you'll get a little taste of the show. Fantastic! I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Karen, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a, a cornucopia of information <laughs> and a <laughs> lot one of, of my fun favorite as well. words. Thank you so much. My favorite word. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. You. I'm lucky, lucky, lucky to know you. Thank you. I I feel the same. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed the podcast, please make sure you like and subscribe to stay updated for future episodes. If you think you'd make a great guest on the Loki podcast, or you know someone who would, or you have any feedback that might help us to improve the show in the future, please email me directly, john at presentinfluence.com, or visit the Present Influence website, or our LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter accounts. We look forward to hearing from you and connecting with you there, and seeing you again on a future episode of the Loki podcast.